Thank you, TBC Band, and thank you, Dr. Dockery, for the privilege of being able to preach the last sermon in this series on 1 Thessalonians. It's exciting also to be preaching on the text that Dr. Dockery chose for 2024 for our theme to be joyful, prayerful, and thankful. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. It's been a a great time going through 1 Thessalonians and we'll then start 2 Thessalonians this Thursday. But I thought, is the PowerPoint able to come on? Thank you. And that's, that's, that's modern Thessalonica, by the way. And that's the White Castle, though there are no hamburgers there. If you're from up north, that goes back to, I believe, Alexander the Great. But that's modern Thessalonica. I thought as we close out the series, it would be good to give you a highlight, at least to me, of the, um, yeah, sorry, uh, is that, can you do the next slide, please? There we go, okay, thank you. A sermon series highlight from our first, first Thessalonians series, and it's been a great opportunity for us to preach through First Thessalonians and now Second Thessalonians. Okay, here, I'm gonna recreate the highlight. Ring, ring. Oh, um, here, honey, would you take care of that, please? (laughs) So we thank Dr. Bradford for those precious memories. (laughs) All right, let's go to the sermon. In conclusion, first of all, The way you begin and end is very important. Whether we're talking about a sermon or a letter from Paul or before you leave and leave your children with the babysitter as you go on a date with your spouse, you have important instructions, the last thing you say to them. Here's the number for poison control. Here's the number for the local vet. There's all these different instructions that you give. Here's what the children should do tonight. So what we see, Paul does the same thing in his letters as he gives the theology in the first part of his letters and then the application in the second part. Here's what you should do as a result of the theology. As Dr. Osborne hears many of his students say, good orthodoxy makes good orthopraxy. And so we see this in Paul's letters by many imperative verbs at the end of his letters. In fact, the text that we'll look at today The last 17 verses of 1 Thessalonians have 17 imperative verbs. Now, an imperative verb is an entreaty or more often a command. And so I jotted a few notes on each of these imperative verbs and we'll be here till maybe two o'clock this afternoon. But we'll look at these verbs to see what did Paul ask them to do and what should we do as a result. Interestingly, what Paul wrote here is very similar to what he wrote in Romans chapter 12. And Gene Green in his pillar commentary says he thinks this was a common core of teachings that Paul gave that really could apply to any church. And we'll see as we read through them today, certainly they apply to us today as well. And I believe these 17 verses fit neatly into four different sections. Now some scholars say, well, it's just a a bunch of random uh, admonitions that Paul gave the church at Thessalonica. But I believe he grouped them, and we'll look at them accordingly. For the first section, I believe the help is the key word here that we could use to uh, organize all of them. So what should believers do to help? So first of all, help your church leaders. And then uh, second of all, help your church family. So church leaders in 12 and 13, help your church family in 14 and 15. Then in 16 through 22, help yourselves. Now, all these imperatives are second person plural, so they're all to the church. But I believe in verse 16, we start seeing where they should look inwardly and and apply that, each one individually as we should as well. And then we see in verses uh, 23 through 28, the end of 1 Thessalonians, where Paul gave a, a prayer, or you could call it more of a blessing that he gave them and then followed by some continued admonitions. So we'll look at this section by section and look at these words and see what God has, what he said to them many years ago, but what he still says to us today. Now we see in verse 12 that 
as I said, this begins this series of these imperatives. There's only four other imperatives in 1 Thessalonians that are not in this section. But also the fact that he mentions brethren there in 12, and he also mentions that in 14. We see that's a kind of a change of subject. So when Paul says brethren, understand, he also means sister in two. Now, whenever we see brothers, we need to look at the context to see if it means just brothers, just men, or if it means sisters as well. But this was a term that the Jews used for fellow Jews. And so the early church took up this term as well, brethren, meaning the church. And so we see that is one of the first terms used for Christians, again, borrowed from the Jews. So this is written to the entire church. We request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. So he's mentioning to the church what they ought to do toward their leaders. And likely these are then the the pastors of the church. Um, This is still fairly early in the life of the church, but it's looking to church leaders. What should all the church do in regard to them? And there are three things that Paul said to do here. First of all, to um, appreciate or respect would be another word that you could uh, translate that with. And of course, as he does this exhortation, this reminds us of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. So it talks about what the leaders do. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. So to obey them, here we see to respect them, to hold them highly. And in verse 13, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. So the esteem them is the third, and then live at peace is, excuse me, esteem them is the second, live at peace is the third uh, admonition that he gave that church. So you are in a different situation. Many of us are church members now, but many of you are planning to one one day be a leader in a church if you're not already. So it's important, as Paul wrote this to the members, what to do toward the leaders, to respect them, to uh, highly appreciate them, and to live at peace. But it's also important on the other side of it, when you are the leader, to accept that graciously. So here's three things I want to remind you as you take these positions of leadership in the church and are on the recipient end of that. Uh, First of all, to go back to verse 12 to look and see what you should be doing. So again, it says that for those who, what are they doing? They are diligently laboring among you and have charge over you. We'll have to answer to God one day for what they do and then give you instruction. So are we doing that effectively as leaders in the church? Then secondly, I encourage you to deflect the praise. As they do praise you, oh, nice sermon, nice lesson or whatever, then I encourage you to deflect it to God. And that will hopefully keep you from getting a big head, right? So nice sermon. Well, thank you. It was a wonderful text. Or isn't God great? Or I mean, how could we not do well as we look at such a great text? So deflect that praise to God. Then third, accept that graciously. Because sometimes you'll have people that will honor you or do something for you that will be very unusual, So if we could bring up the next slide. I had a lady in one of my churches that she thought this would be a great gift for me. And I, in my seven office moves here at Southwestern, I've lost it, but it was a fur boutonniere. Now, it looked exactly like that without the cat head. So just forget the cat head for a moment, but that's what it looked like. And she was doing that to show her love for her pastor. And she wanted me to wear that every sermon. So next slide, please. Imagine me preaching a sermon. I mean, that would be totally distracting if I wore that. But I wanted to honor her and be gracious to her and thank you for doing that. And so I thought for weeks, what can I do? What can I do? Because I can't wear that every sermon, but she'll be disappointed if I don't. So I decided it worked out really well. It was winter time. And so I have an overcoat and I put it on the overcoat. So when I came into the church building, I made sure that I found her and said hi, and she saw the big humongous boutonniere there, and then she saw it was on my overcoat, so then I could take it off and then set it aside and not to have to, pre- to preach in it. 
But my point is this, sometimes people will do things for you and be gracious to you and, and kind to you in unusual ways, but we wanna be respectful of them and kind to them and uh, honor them as well. It's a great privilege to be leading God's people, but it's also a large responsibility. And so I just want you to know that you'll sometimes come across unusual uh, situations. So again, the third thing that he said at the end of verse 13 is live at peace with one another. And this is such a great help to church leaders because if the people are not at peace, then there's a great expenditure of time among, uh, from the leaders in having to put out all of these different fires. So one of the great things we can do is to be at peace and be what Jesus called a peacemaker. That was the seventh beatitude Jesus gave in Matthew chapter five, and that is blessed are the peacemakers. And a peacemaker is not a trouble avoider. It's someone that goes, when you see a difficulty, you go right in there, maybe even standing in between those people that are having difficulties and help bring about peace. Our pastor, Dr. Jeffress, likes to give this illustration to the deacon body as well as the church members. Everyone walks around with two buckets. One is full of water and one is full of gasoline. So whenever you come across a little fire, maybe church gossip or someone upset with somebody else, you can do one of two things. You can pour the bucket of gasoline on it and it grows larger and affects more of the church in a negative way. Or you can pour your water bucket, which is of course the obvious choice, and put out the fire. So it's not just that we don't do the wrong things, that we go around looking for opportunities for us to bring peace, to be peacemakers, and then as we who are the members of the body are helping to keep the peace, then the leaders can do their God-called responsibilities. And of course, then as you're a leader, you really appreciate then when members are doing that because then you don't get sidetracked from what God is calling you to do. So that's the first section, to help your leaders. Second, help your church family. So verse 14 um, then we see uh, actually four of the imperatives in this verse. And some commentators think this is still what the leaders are supposed to do, but there's no indication of that. I really believe this is the, this verse and the next verse in verse 15 are what all of us should do to help the church family, to help others. We urge you brethren, so I think we see a little change of subject again there as we did in verse 12. Again, with sister and also, so this is everyone in the church. Admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all men. This is kind of a good, bad, and ugly situation. There's all kinds in the church. And I believe it's a great measure of effectiveness in ministry as to how effectively you minister to the difficult people to those on the outskirts, to those that are having a hard time. Jesus talks about in the parable of the sheep and goats that he's looking for you to help the least of these. And I believe Paul is mentioning some of that here in this chapter where uh, in this verse of the difficult people that we encounter. And I guarantee you in ministry you will. Many of you know that already. But everywhere God calls you to ministry, there are some people that are difficult to love. They either are hard to get along with or they're socially inept or different or they're just kind of a square peg that's trying to get into a round hole and it's not very effective or they just rub people the wrong way. Now here, what do you call those people? Professors, right? <laughs> and guess what we call you? Our wonderful students. <laughs> but we all come across people like that and, and sometimes those people can be a drain on your ministry because some, they just wanna come and hang around and, and be a bother. Well, at first, as I began in being a summer youth minister and then as a pastor, I, I kind of had a, a negative idea about people like that. But then I realized, you know, for all the goofy, dumb things that some people do, I had this insight, that's probably how I am to God. And it gave me a real appreciation then for those, even the, the weirdest ones to go really, I mean, I know I'm weird, I admit that. 
but to realize that they need love and they, they need help from God. And, and I do too. So it gave me a new insight. And I really do believe God builds a lot of character into your life as you love the unlovely. You know, it's, it's easy to love those that are popular and are healthy spiritually. Sure, that's easy to love th those people. But what about those that are difficult, those that are hard to love, those who, may, again, may rub everybody the wrong way? And one thing I found helpful as well with that is try to think of at least one positive thing for that person. Most people love their mother, so that may be the only thing you can think of. But think, you know, I'm sure he loves his mother, or she loves her mother, and focus on that. And then make that a matter of prayer. God, help me to look for ways that would encourage that person to build them up. Maybe if they need a change in direction to help me do that. But to focus on those that are difficult. And as Paul wrote these different situations here, the unruly were those that were either idle and not doing anything because they thought Jesus was coming any minute. So why do anything? And no, we need to be at work <laughs> while we wait for Jesus to come back or they're unruly and causing problems. And then the faint-hearted, those that are too scared to do anything and you need to help them get bold in Christ. Some people are too scared to share their testimony. You need to give them experiences in doing that and, and to, to help them to see what it's like to be a winsome and bold witness for Christ. And it may be taking them one-on-one -on -one and witnessing encounters and then you let them see you do it and then you Ask them to do that part that you did and modeled for them, but to guide them through so they get uh, strong in their faith. And then the weak, and that could be weak in any way, uh, spiritually it could be those that are falling into various sins. And then to, um, as it says, to help them, you're, you wanna bring them back to the right path and be patient with everyone. And that's, that's a good all-inclusive uh, for whatever needs there are that people have. Uh, we need to have patience with them and realize things will not change overnight. When somebody's difficult to love and you start loving them, they won't immediately become a very loving person. It may be a, a long project. By the way, when I say difficult to love, if I make eye contact with you, Dr. McKellar, I'm not really meaning you, but it's like, you know, whenever you preach on sin and you make eye contact, they're thinking, oh, does he know? <laughs> anyway, so helping your church family. And verse 15 goes right along with that because there's a, it's not a Bible verse, though some people may think it is. No good deed goes unpunished, right? Hezekiah 3.16. And it makes sense that the next verse follows what Paul just said because as you do this ministry and as you do good, then there will be difficulties that will come as a result. People um, will be mad. Uh, they'll they'll do mean things sometimes. And so he says, see that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all men. Well, Jesus talked about this as well, as um, Jesus said that we are supposed to uh, love our enemies and to uh, do good, be kind, even to those who persecute you. And I believe that's only accomplished by the grace of God. That God's, God gives you the strength, the ability then to return, repay uh, love for any evil that's done against you. So that works very well together. So in 14 and 15, we see how we should relate to others in the church family. And again, I don't see these as tasks just for the leaders. We're all supposed to do that. So we're all supposed to look for those, especially in the need of love and be loving them and helping them and be patient with them. And I believe the key to that is discipleship. And hopefully you are discipling others and, and um, then even experiencing being discipled by others. I encourage you in ministry to have some mentors. So in the same gender mentor as you, someone that you can uh, go to for advice and for help. I found that to be a great help both in the pastorate as well as here uh, teaching at seminary. And they can be a great uh, guide for you and a, a good resource for you uh, and advice for you whenever you have a difficulty. But we should see these relationships in working together all through the church. Then in verse 16, I believe we see a turn here now to helping yourselves. In other words, an inward focus 
whereas we've seen an outward focus in 12 and 13 to the church leaders, then 14 and 15 to the church body or the church family. And then in 16, while it's still in the context of what we're doing as believers, but it's inward. And verses 16, 17, and 18 work so well together. Uh, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. When I was a child in Sunday school, every once in a while they'd ask us to quote a Bible verse. Well, and we'd go around the room. So you know the first three verses is always John 3, 16, or Genesis 1, 1, and we knew that verse and the reference, and the third was what? Jesus Jesus wept, right? (laughs) We had no clue where it was. We didn't know why Jesus wept. We just knew he wept at some point, and we'd like to do that because we thought it was the shortest verse in the Bible, but it's actually not the shortest verse in the Bible. Uh, It's actually three words in the Greek, as I tell our classes when we go through that, but 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 17 are the shortest verses by word count. They're each just two Greek words. But I didn't know, didn't know this till preparing this sermon. There's actually a shorter verse in the Bible, if you count, or in the New Testament, I'll say, anyway. If you count the letters, anyone know what the shortest verse in the New Testament is? Letter count? I didn't know. It's Luke 20, verse 30. Now, I know some of you are gonna look it up because you don't believe me. But Luke 20, verse 30 It's actually and the second, but by the number of letters, it's the shortest verse. Just a little trivia. You never know when that will be helpful for you to know that Bible trivia. But as we go to these shortest verses in the Greek anyway, as far as word count, rejoice always. What a great encouragement. Now, you might ask, really? Always? Even in poverty, like where most seminary students are, yes, according to 2 Corinthians 8, verse 2. Even in persecution, yes, that's throughout the scriptures. Acts 5, verse 42, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 4. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, where it talked about them being persecuted and rejoicing. Even in trials, like your next term paper or the final exams coming up or other trials that we have, Yes, according to what? You know that James 1, 2. I count it all, all joy when you encounter, as King James said, divers trials, which I thought that was about skin diving until I realized, no, it's various trials, all these difficulties that we have. How can we have joy in all of these difficulties? Well, it's because it's on the inside. It's not dependent upon any outward circumstance. So regardless of the situation, even death, even the death of a Christian martyr, it's been a lot of fun this semester going through the book of Revelation with my, with my class taking that. And we see a, a big emphasis on martyrdom. And God loves Christian martyrs. He loves to see the, the death of his saints. Even in that unusual situation, God is at work. And God is bringing about good and even in the most difficult of situations. But I don't believe we can or should look at these verses in isolation. I think Paul kept them short so we'd see them connected. So rejoice always. Really? Yes, always. And then pray consistently. Pray continually. Continually be a matter of prayer. And why does that fit together? Well, I believe that as we pray, that helps our focus be upon God. And so no matter what we're going through, then we have the right perspective because we know God is in control. Maybe we don't know what all God is going to bring out of that, but we know God is in control. My senior year in high school, I had a motorcycle wreck and was on Central Expressway and going 70 was the speed limit back then. That's a long time ago. But uh, I, I slid off of it. So I slid on the concrete with no jacket, no leather jacket on, And anyway, long story short, I had deep second degree burns. It was all wrapped up except for my tip of my pointer fingers on each hand. As a senior in high school, mom and dad had to feed me, dress me, help me use the restroom. Talk about embarrassing for a high school senior. Put in my contacts, all of that. And I really had a hard time seeing how good (laughs) is going to come out with that from that experience. But... In that, I had a lot of spare time on my hands, and so my friend and I wrote a comedy act and started entering in talent shows. Long story short, 
we started entertaining at churches and that's the way I got my spending money both at Baylor and here at seminary was performing. We worked at Six Flags a whole summer and learned how to read an audience and you're going, well, you're not doing it very well right now. But all of that was a result, I have no doubt, of that accident. Because if I hadn't been sitting around for that time period, I would have not have stopped to, to take in time to write that comedy act through which God brought so many, opened so many doors and so many opportunities. And you may not know as you go through a difficulty what God is doing, but you can trust that God has everything under control. So we pray about it. God helps us to give, get that right perspective but then in everything, give thanks. Again, I, I see all of these three working together. You're going, really? Get, be thankful for my term paper? I never remember I was a student, as a student here in that, well, outside Truett Chapel, I was about to point there, we're in a different building. Outside Truett Chapel in that men's restroom, I saw, praise God for final exams written on the restroom wall. In the, in the restrooms, we shouldn't have graffiti, but when it is, it's Christian. So I'm thinking, Praise God for final exams. And then I got to thinking about, okay, in everything, give thanks. And even in the, the difficult times, the hard times, yes, give thanks, knowing that God is at work. You mean even for bad things that happen? Yes, because that's how powerful God is. And I don't, I'm not putting final exams as bad things. I'm, I'm moving on to a different example. That's how powerful God is. God is able to bring good out of any difficulty that God allows to happen to you. And it wouldn't happen to you had not God have allowed it. You know, Romans 8, 28 doesn't say that everything that happens to us is good. It says God causes that for the good. God's able to bring good out of that. And so again, all of this works together for what God is doing, the, the good that God is desiring to bring about in our lives. So I want to give you an example, just again, in reviewing to rejoice always, to always be joyful in all matters, to pray without ceasing and everything, give thanks. So I have this black bag representing difficulties that happen. So uh, hard term paper, you're having a hard time even getting started to write that. Difficulty about that professor made it comprehensive on the final exam, how dare he or she do that. So you have to do all this studying. Or maybe uh, illness that you have, in you or a family member, or it may be even be the, the death of a, a loved one. And you know, a seminary this size, every day we have students that go through tragedies, difficulties, some that are even from another country and then a loved one gets sick or even a loved one dies. And that's so hard to be far away from them in that situation. So these are difficulties, but we have faith in God knowing that God is going to bring something beautiful out of these difficulties that he brings our way. Now you don't need no, to But see all the, intro, all the different design there. It's like someone told me about, I don't know how to do any of this, uh, I, I forgot what it's called, point counterpoint and all that stuff, these different things that women do. And you look at it on the top, it's beautiful. <laughs> I don't even know what it's called. But you look below and there are all these threads hanging down. So right now, what we see are a bunch of threads hanging down. Got this problem, that problem, that problem. We got challenges here at Southwestern that the Lord is, is, is helping us get stronger and stronger every day that goes by. But sometimes we just see the threads. I think our prayers should be, Lord, help me to see the other side sometime. Because on the other side, it's a, a beautiful uh, uh, work of art that God is doing and that God is doing in your life. And so rather than be mad about the bad times or to, to curse that, instead to be thankful for that, say, thank you, God, I know that you are at work. Well, I need to move along. Verse 19, do not quench the spirit. You know, the, I think that's one of the worst things that Christians should do. Now, Paul talks about sexual sin is worse because it's, it's outside the body, 1 Corinthians uh, 9, uh, verse 16, but... I think quenching the spirit, you could make a good case. That's one of the worst sins as well. That would be both individually and as a church. In other words, what the Holy Spirit is doing, remember back the buckets of water. Well, we ought to be pouring water, on, I mean, bucket of water and in, in, in the bucket of gas, pour water on the, the fires that are difficulties, 
But when we see the fire of the Holy Spirit at work, that's when we need to use the gasoline bucket. Now, not literally, okay, not, not literally, it's just the illustration, but we want that to grow and want to see the Holy Spirit's work multiply, both in your life as you'd walk by the Spirit and use your spiritual gifts in ministry and in the life of the church as the Holy Spirit gives direction to the church and the Holy Spirit leads in opportunities to share the gospel and, and various emphases and, and ways to train the people to do that. So you don't want to stifle or quench the work of the Holy Spirit. You want to be one that enables and works that that would increase. Now, the Holy Spirit, that Greek word pneuma for spirit and then the Hebrew word ruach, it means spirit. It can also mean breath or wind. So this little bag is, a, I think, a good illustration of what the Holy Spirit does because most of his work is behind the scenes. He is unseen. And yet we see the results of what he does. Now, look at the results of when I will fill this bag full of air. Now, rather than blow into it, I'll just gather air like this. Now, I could run around the platform, but I'll, I'll try to not do that. Look at all this result. We had a little bitty bag that squashed up small, but now with the air inside, it's huge. And that's like what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. Again, unseen, but since he's unseen, we might tend to ignore him. And the Holy Spirit doesn't yell at us. The Holy Spirit has a still, small voice. And so we want to make sure that we listen to his voice. And I think we're in tune with him as we have a life of prayer and doing the Lord's work. Then we see what he does. And then we join him in that ministry. All right, verse 20. Do not, this, here's just these uh, several admonitions again individually. Do not despise prophetic utterance. Now, have you ever had a prophetic utterance? Ooh, I think I'm about, I feel an utterance coming forth from my belly. Well, I think what he's talking about there in the early church, of course, they didn't have the New Testament yet. So they had these spiritual gifts, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and uh, prophecy, and of course, sermons. And so what he's saying is don't despise that. Don't look down on it. God is using that. I think the application today is mostly don't look down on preaching, but do what? Verse 21, examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good. And I think Paul may have been thinking about the Bereans. You know, from Thessalonica, Paul went on that second missionary journey to Berea, and it said they were more noble-minded. They searched the scriptures daily to make sure what they heard was true. And I believe that's what Paul's telling the church at Thessalonica. You examine everything. Don't just accept anyone's word for it. Make sure it is true. Uh, make sure it's according to the word. They had the Old Testament. Now we have the Old and New Testament. So a great admonition. Then verse 20, uh, 20 uh, two, which is very inclusive, abstain from every form of evil. You might go, wait a minute, how about a little evil? No, even a tiny bit of evil? No, every form, or you could translate that, every appearance. Even if it looks evil, then don't do that. Even if you're not doing wrong, if it looks like you're doing wrong, that is a negative testimony to others. Now verse 23, and this is the, the last section, where Paul closes it out with, a, I think, a blessing is what I would call this. You can call it a prayer, but also some final admonitions. I would call these more entreaties at the end. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We just talked about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in the, uh, earlier in this chapter and in the previous chapter. And um, as he talks about sanctifying, he's talked about, he, he told them to be sanctified, we're saved, then sanctified is being set apart and made, being made more like the Lord. And thinking about all that he's written in 1 Thessalonians about their growth and about their difficulties, but being strong uh, it, it, through that. Now, we don't have time to get into, nor was I planning to, about is Paul saying three parts of a person, body, soul, spirit, trichotomy, or two parts, uh, soul, slash, spirit, and body, or one part, body, so trichotomy, dichotomy, or bichotomy, or uh, monophysite, or is he, uh, uh, well, anyway, we'll just leave it at that. So we will not talk about that, whether you're tripartite, bipartite, monophysite. Um, we don't want to end at a dogfight or a fistfight. 
which in hindsight would not be all right in a real low light. So we'll move on from there. That's not the key in verse 23 anyway. The key is all, your whole self, that God sanctify you, set you apart from the world, and keep you pure from the world. Verse 24, faithful is he who calls you who will also bring it to pass. And that's not just the call to full-time Christian vocational ministry. That's God's call to every Christian for what he wants you to do as a believer. Now, then the entreaties, verse 25, brethren, pray for us. Again, brethren and sister, and pray for Paul. How do we apply that here at Southwestern? Pray for our seminary. Pray for our faculty, our administration. Pray for the students. Pray for the workers. God is doing a, a a beautiful work through you. Now, I'm excited about what he is doing and pray for God to continue to grow the work that God is doing here at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Now, verse 26, this is uh, what some would see as the highlight. Dr. Yarnell mentioned this in his sermon last Thursday. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. Do I hear an amen? Not, you're not very excited about that. Um, now, so if you will, turn to the person on your left, pucker up. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do, don't do that. But Dr. Yarnell did mention he's glad he wasn't preaching this passage. So don't let the day end before you give Dr. Yarnell a big kiss. <laughs> but of course, the, the application here, because if, if you gave someone a holy kiss, you'd get a holy slap in return. I think a holy, <laughs> a holy fist bump or elbow bump would be better. I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren, which is the way they did with letters back then. They'd read them over and over and over. And so there's no better way to end this sermon than with Paul's final uh, prayer, really, uh, in verse 28. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And that's my message to you. Let me lead us in prayer. God, we thank you for the privilege of studying your word. We thank you for these wonderful admonitions that are just as applicable to us as they were when Paul wrote them to the church at Thessalonica. And pray that we would live this out. And as we've been called at the beginning of this year to, uh, to respond to these admonitions, um, to be joyful and prayerful and thankful. God, that that would be uh, the way to describe our lives as we follow you in love. For I ask this in your son Jesus' name, amen.